I know a man who came here and got 12 tickets within 20 days. Whoa. 12 tickets. And some of them, did, like all of them, very minor things, including a parking ticket. Like they, it was like they were following him every time he walked out the door. Wow. Every time he walked out the door. Label Machine Podcast. Um, I'm Cameron Smith. And today we have Mia Schultz. Mia Schultz is the president of the Rutland, Vermont branch of the NAACP. Uh, Mia Schultz, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Cameron. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Um, so the the biggest reason why I wanted to talk to you was because, um, you know, sometimes when I'm just searching on the internet for different, very niche, uh, weird things um, that relate to marginalization, I find something that feels like a massive nugget and also a massive story. Um, and so I sort of um, happened across uh, incarceration rates um, going state by state, uh, released by the Sentencing Project. Um, and I believe in 2016, uh, Vermont has one of the highest incarceration rates for particularly um, black males um, in the nation. Um, and I thought, man, this is like an incredibly interesting situation and something that I need to talk to someone about. So um, I think we could first start by just going back a little bit. And I just want to know if you could first start by explaining a little bit about um, what your job is and sort of um, just what what you do working for the, the NAACP. Sure, yeah. So, um, so I am the president of the Rutland area branch and in Vermont, and we are all volunteers, all of the executive and the people who are members of the NAACP are, are volunteers. So in my volunteer capacity as president, um, we try to, as NAACP has done for the last 113 years, try to move the mark, push the, push the needle to, remove and eliminate discrimination in all of our systems. And that includes the criminal justice system. And it has not escaped us that Vermont is one of the highest proportionately in incarceration rates of black, black men in particular, um, but also Hispanic and, and indigenous people as well. And so, yeah, that is kind of a, a big, a, a big myth buster, right? That you think, well, are there even black people in Vermont? Um, and there are today that there are (laughs) they are here and they seem to be all incarcerated right no that's not even funny but it is true it seems like the that proportionately um black men are if you look at our traffic data police stop traffic data um black men are black men and hispanic men are pulled over um disproportionately than their white peers. And so, um, yeah, that leads to um, disproportionate incarceration rates. Wow. Okay. So um, I'm sure, you know, as the president of NAACP, a lot of maybe uh, specific stories and experiences um, come across your desk. Um, Are are most of those stories pertaining to experiences being pulled over? What, what are some of the stuff that you hear that you could maybe tell me about? Sure. I mean, we see it in traffic stops. In fact, there have been some high level cases um, with the ACLU and such that have come out in, in terms of um, traffic stops that lead to uh, incarceration. One of them in particular, um, Vermont, the state of Vermont versus Greg Zulu, who was, he was stopped for having snow on his license plate. Well, if you know anything about Vermont, it snows a lot here. (laughs) (laughs) And so you might have from time to time some snow sitting on your, your license plate. He was pulled over under that premise of having that snow on his license plate. Turns out that it wasn't even um, a law to that. uh, And having snow on your license plate is reason for stopping somebody. Uh, That led to um, uh, an escalation where um, he was being accused of having, at the time, marijuana was illegal. It is legal now. But at the time, it was illegal to having marijuana in the car and a search and all of these things. And so after a long, drawn out 
court battle with the ACLU, uh, Greg Zulu was awarded $50,000 for that um, because he was, they found that he was uh, stopped illegally in the first place. And then the, you know, the circumstances after that led to the lawsuits. So uh, we also have cases where, um, you know, um, they fit the description, mm -hmm. right? When you have a state that is majority white, every black man fits a description. Yeah. Every brown man fits the description. So we are trying to, we work hand in hand with, um, with um, organizations like the ACLU to try to grab the attention and make a difference in, in those statistics. But we see it even beyond um, traffic stops, right? We see it in um, any kind of um, law enforcement and subsequent um, um, law, um, law enforcement engagement and then subsequent engagement with our court systems, right? We see disproportionate um, sentencing. We see disproportionate plea bargains or, or being forced into plea bargains and things like that. So it's all part of the ecosystem. It is the ecosystem that exists in America as a whole. But I think that in a state like Vermont, it's even more pronounced because we there is such a little um, population of black and brown folks here. Okay. So there, there is a very small population of, of black and brown people in Vermont. And, you know, like you said, that, that does lead to sort of someone, you know, fitting a description. Um, do you think there is um, more bias aside from that? Um, like, for example, say, um, you know, someone does uh, fit a description and that they are pulled over. Um, but, you know, once their um, information is checked, they, they, they seem good to go in some way or something. Do you find that... Um, maybe, you know, these people are um, harassed by police and law enforcement officials, or, or um, not even so far as that, but um, are they are they treated more um, aggressively? I mean, I, I, I think that we see that as, you know, the, the escalation of things happens um, when, um, when we have law enforcement involved across the nation, but even so here, like I'll give, I live in a town called Bennington. It's a small town, 15,000 people um, population. And there's a big, there has a lot of lawsuits have come out of here and, and especially with police involvement. And we have some of the highest traffic, like I was talking about traffic stop data here. Yeah. What happens is um, there is a whole mentality across the board, regardless of race. Um, there's a socioeconomic piece that goes along there that the police here have a warrior mentality, right? And so they treat you immediately as a as a bad guy, wow. right? And um, they attribute that to the location of where we live. We live at the southernmost, the southern tip of Vermont, which is connected to New York and Massachusetts. Right. And so they say that a lot of the drugs that come in to from New York and Massachusetts, which have urban um, inhabitants that happen to be black and brown. That's what we call them, urban inhabitants. <laughs> come in to, to Bennington to sell their drugs. Okay. And so they 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 justify the um, kind of the bullying or the warrior mentality to being in this particular location where people from Mass and people from from New York come in to sell drugs, hmm. and so they use that as as a reasoning and justification for targeting Black and Brown people. Wow. Do you yeah. believe the warrior mentality is is warranted in any way, given maybe a sort of, you know, amount of crime that comes through Vermont? I don't. I don't. I think that we're looking at the at the we're looking at a symptom and we're not looking at the whole disease mm -hmm. um, and not um, if the, our town has inhabitants that crave the products that the people are selling when they come into this town. Right. Um, 
it doesn't matter how many of them you lock up or how many of them that you target, there will always be people who come in to sell those particular drugs because there's a demand for it. Right. Uh, so if you're not treating the disease, which is substance abuse disorder, right. um, then you're going to, you're going to have people come in to sell to, you know, it's capitalism, right? Yeah. yeah um, sure. So, so um, yeah, I mean, I think that the focus is on the wrong piece of it. Yeah. Yeah. If we don't have a community who is looking for these, uh, for the drugs that these people are bringing in, then then we don't have anything to worry about. But funny thing is, is when they do, the traffic data suggests that when they do search black and brown folks, cars and go through, they're less likely to find anything. And they're more likely to find it in white and in 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 the white people that they do decide to search. Right. So search rates are up for black and brown folks. Yeah. Without any results. Right? right. Meaning that we're not the ones necessarily bringing them in. Yeah. Right? And and when they do search white people not as highly as they do black and brown folks, they are more likely to find uh, the things that they're looking for. Uh, so it's just kind of backwards thinking to me to assume that um, the black and brown folks are the only ones bringing, number one, the drugs, and to assume that they are bringing drugs, right? Um, so they justify a lot of that with our location and with the um, and with the opioid crisis that we're, we're, we're facing here in this community. Yeah. Can you um, tell me a little bit more about um, sort of what you see with the opioid crisis in Vermont. Um, I know it's a, you know, it's a huge thing nationwide and in many, many states. I think, you know, um, where I'm at in, in Maryland, um, it was actually like ranked as like, you know, the, the highest rates of, of you know, um, of like addiction rates. Um, so what, what has been your experience with people in, in the opioid crisis in Vermont? I mean, you know, it, it, it's a disease now. It's classified as a disease, as a disorder, instead of well, like I remember, like I'm old. I'm I'm old enough to be in the '90s, and in the '90s, um, you know, the war against drugs, and it was specifically against crack, and they didn't normal. They didn't normalize it as a disease then. Right. Uh, they criminalized our people in particular, um, in um, with the the crack epidemic. Mm -hmm. And so um, in this community, I am seeing a little bit more compassion in addressing it as a disease as it should be. Um, um, and it is uh, an issue that people want to hide. And by using police uh, to to kind of soothe their souls or soothe their like um, be the bad guys in the situation, yeah. Um, it keeps people in the cycle instead of using techniques, um, to help people, um, free themselves from the, from substance abuse disorder. So yeah. I see it, I see it as, a, um, an issue that is not really properly being addressed. And I think if we were to use resources, this, the resources that we throw into police, instead use it and throw it into helping people with substance abuse. I see it all over town, yeah. all over town. It's very unfortunate. It's very sad. And it does remind me, it reminiscent of the crack epidemic. And, and back then we, we, we didn't know better or we did, or it was specifically attributed to black and brown people. And now that we see that white people are being affected, in fact, more in a, in a town like this, um, you would think that they would want to address it right. more aggressively. You know, I, I actually find that kind of surprising that um, there isn't like um, more addressing of sort of the, the, the opioid issues, especially somewhere like Vermont. I mean, I guess, you know, the, the stereotype of Vermont is, um, you know, it's where Ben and Jerry's comes from and it's like, um, a liberal paradise and um 
you know, I, I would think to maybe compare it to, um, you know, maybe the closest we have stereotypically to, to a place like Canada, where, you know, Canada, um, they, they're, they're very left and they care about their people and, you know, they have um, universal health care and things like that. And um, the people are, are better taken care of. Um, it, comparative to other states, do you see in Vermont sort of um, more compassion for the people in terms of um, sort of, um, you know, the, the opioid crisis and, and medical related things? Do you do you see even a little bit of compassion? Because, you know, where I'm at, I don't really yeah, see. Yeah, absolutely. I do. I see that they try. They, they, there are certain places and there are places they, they do hand out, like, for example, I forget what it is, the methadone, methadone I don't know what it is. Yeah. I'm not really like skilled up on the, on the things, the suboxone or whatever, you know, they, they, I, I do see that there is compassion for it. Yeah. You know, listen, I, I moved here with that same idea that like, this is where Ben and Jerry's and <laughs> Sanders is like yeah, a bunch hurts. of hippies out here. And yeah. like, what, what, what could there be to be scared of? Like, I get it. That seems like a lot of white people, but let me just say this and that a place is not majority white on accident. Yeah is no accident yeah right and so it's it's like i have seen people come people of color come professionals from professionals on in every blue collar workers everybody they cannot right. handle it too much there is a lot of that a lot of um there's a lot of racism here from blatant outright um i mean we have i have confederate flags flying around my neighborhood yeah. in the you north know, yeah in the north yeah. right um so it's not it's not majority white on accident and yeah. so um and so they just hide it really well mm -hmm. and they hide it with nice racism that's the other racism we see is that that those microaggressions those slights that you're like wait did that just just happen did yeah. they just like touch my hair? Did they just sure. write? Uh, so so it it's 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 an insidious type of racism that that is is that starts with a smile. Mm -hmm. And the police are that way too. The police are that way too. So we can see that translate, and, and so with the whole in, entire criminal justice system, so we can see that translate into our our incarceration rates, our traffic data rates, mm -hmm. our our um, school discipline rates. We see that with children of color are disciplined at higher rates than, than other children. Um, all of the things you see um, in the United States across the board, you see here, but it seems more pronounced because there's so few of us here. Yeah, yeah. What, what have been, um, so you've said that, you know, professionals come in and, and they, they have a hard time and they leave. Um, what would you say is maybe the difference between um, those professionals and, and sort of your personal experience in Vermont and how have, how have you gotten along? How have I gotten years? along? Let me tell you, I, there are times I'm like, what did I do? Yeah. I have to get out of here. <laughs> I have been here seven years and it has been a, a like an up and down roller coaster. You don't have kids here who've spent a good portion of their formative years. My oldest right now is about to graduate. Or no, he just graduated from high school. He's going to college tomorrow, literally. Um, and so they have they have spent their years here. We have found ways to adjust. And honestly, I the ways to adjust was mommy speaking up. I am the the president of NAACP because I was speaking up. Yeah. because of things that happened to our family and that I wanted to make sure that didn't happen to other kids and didn't happen to other families. Um, and my fiance as well, he's been here for 20 years. He's a black man. He has been incarcerated uh, because of accusations and things and situations that, that are, were racially motivated. Yeah. And he also has, has been the recipient of many, many traffic tickets and being pulled over for not using your, uh, your turn signal within five, 50 feet within a stop sign. Like yeah. all of those things have happened to him. And I think um, for him, it was a matter of, well, I came from the city. I came from Coney Island the Brooklyn and 
there was a lot of violence there and there was a lot, I didn't have any opportunity at all. Right. And I've been able to be somewhat, um, somewhat removed from all of that. Uh, yeah. And so we make do and we figure it out. For me, it was, you become an activist. Mm -hmm. That's how I made it. I became an activist so that my kids would be safe in school. Because once they know I'm not going to play around and I'm going to call them out, they know not to mess with my kids. Yeah. And so that was, that was kind of the result. That's how I was able to stay, but not everybody has that in them to do that. Right. And, um, and so they leave, they leave and it, and it happens with employment, with your jobs. It happens in every facet in the hospital, all of the systems that oppress us, they have, they oppress us here in Vermont as well, right. but it's even more pronounced. You're so incredibly, you're visible and invisible at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean by that? Yeah. You're super visible because of the way you look. People are going to turn. They're going to be, they're going to treat you. And then they're going to invisibilize you. Your opinion doesn't matter. Your health doesn't matter. Yeah. You no, know, all of those things don't matter. You're an invisible person. Your opinions, all of those things, your lens, your point of view mean nothing. Yeah. However, you're super visible because you're in a space where there's like a majority white people. Yeah, your your physical being is is um is visible, but maybe you know the things that really make up who you are 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 invisible. My kids don't see themselves in the curriculum, and when they do, yeah. it's only um, slavery, for example. Right, right. Only certain things that they are they see themselves, and usually it's um, it, it it's negative. Yeah. We need to learn that stuff. I'm not saying we don't need to learn it. We also need to learn about our accomplishments and things like that. I was actually watching uh, like an interview of uh, Chris Rock um, a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about um, in the interview, he was talking about how his dad, uh, his dad's job was to be sort of like um, a union uh, sort of interrupter where to where his dad would get placed in situations and in, in, in sort of white spaces in New York and different industries and like truck driving and, and like industries that hadn't been um, integrated yet. And um, he was sort of the type of personality that they needed something, someone that was um, sort of stoic that wouldn't um, um, sort of be crushed at uh, maybe the amount of racism that he was experiencing at the time. Um, and so I think I say that to, to ask like, um, do you think um, um, you've been able to fare well in Vermont, as you said, because of um, sort of your ability to speak up, but do you think um, that like that as a black person in Vermont, do you think that is a necessary trait to be able to survive? To, 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 to need yeah, to we, all, we all have our own survival techniques for sure. And it's interesting that you bring that up because I was just, I like, I have so much compassion for our people because I was just like, sometimes I can just like, I could hand money. I was like, here's $500 to start a business. And they were like, for what? Why? I don't trust it. I know I'm not doing it. Right. right. Um, but we all have ways that we manage and deal with it. And, and in different ways, I know black people who have were born and raised in Vermont and they have found ways to navigate around it. They will report horrific racism, yeah. horrific, blatant racism, especially in schools. Right. Yeah. And, and, and unchecked. Right. So if you were in a school, well, I originally came from Arizona and then um, lived in California for a while. Yeah. And if, if, if I was going to be, if I was called the N word, for example, or something really racist happened by another child, like there's, there are steps and protocol for handling that. And that kid is not going to do that anymore. Right. Get that in the bud. So when my kids came here, they had never been called the N word. Yeah. Within a week of being here, they were called the N word. Not only were they called the N word, they um, didn't even call to alert me. 
that they were called that. I, my son came home crying. Like, I don't understand why this happened. This kid did. And I called and they're like, well, you understand the, the child who did that. No, I don't understand. The child who did it has a disability and this is and that. And so they make up reasons on why they don't want to approach this uncomfortable conversations because yeah. they never had to deal with them before because their landscape was so segregated. There were not people of color. So right. they don't know how to have the conversations and check that so that others know not to do it. So it just happens. I want to say the biggest complaints I have are not necessarily from those who are incarcerated. Yeah. They're from schools right. and from kids who are, who are recipients. And so parents, the first thing they want to do is make a better life and protect their kids. Yeah. And so that is a main reason that people leave is because it's no longer sustainable for their kids to have a good education here. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but other people find ways to, uh, find ways to navigate around it, whether it's just put your head down, there's, you know, that sort of thing. There's, they're just different techniques and really just doing things to assimilate. Some yeah. people just assimilate and ignore it. Like, let's just no, don't. And a lot of people tell me that you make too much noise. Yeah. They're going to, they're going to come after you. Yeah. We have literally had our first state res representative from Bennington to be represented, represent us in the legislature was ran out of town. Wow. It was not protected. I mean, it made international news. Yeah. Like, like, Kaya, 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 Kaya Morris, okay. right. Kaya Morris, right. Yeah. And we saw that in lots of examples throughout the state. We, I can name four women who were in black women yeah. who were in some sort of leadership position elected offices mostly in which they they endured horrific horrific racism and so they were forced to step down because it was not sustainable it was like not worth it for them anymore yeah. their security and well-being were at so they figure out other ways but again it's not is this is not an accident is because it goes unchecked there are no, there are no steps. There's nothing in there for security for, for our people. Mm -hmm. It's not a priority. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see, um, um, you, you sort of began to talk about it, about, um, sort of the, the, the type of place that Bennington and, and overall Vermont is, is it more, um, are you going to school with like, you know, sort of rich white kids or like, is it sort of like a rural type demographic poor? What's sort of, um, that it's so rural and so poor. Okay. So poor. And that is why you see a lot, like uh, the rise of Trump uh, yeah. really did in, engage and ignite the poor, poor community, poor white communities here. Yeah. And I want to say across the United States, right. Yeah. It emboldened them. It made them feel like they were so we have seen an uptick in again confederate flags um and overt racism here um as a result um because it's it's based in ignorance wow. um, and and lack of education here and and i'm part of our of the people who again don't want to have these conversations don't want to bring race into it don't want to talk about race, don't want to talk about why Confederate flags are wrong, why the N-word is wrong, why, you know, the history of, of you know, oppression and black and brown folks throughout yeah. history. Like, none of that is really discussed because it's too uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. But it is a makeup of mostly low, econ low socioeconomics. Hmm. What sort of, um, like, the the job situation like in Vermont? Is, are there any specific industries like, you know, in Maryland, we have crabbing and, and things like that. Where, how, how does someone get a job in, in Vermont? 
That's an interesting question because I think it's evolved over the years and the centuries and Vermont has gone through hard times. Like we, they used to have factories, a lot of factories and things like that, that were here. Yeah. We had an energizer building here not, not too long ago, like pre COVID yeah. and that went under. Um, um, right now, the largest employer in this particular area is the hospital. Uh -huh. um, and in uh, the town, like about an hour from here, the largest employer is like there is GE. Uh, okay. So we have like a big um, GE, big conglomerate there. Um, so there are some some avenues for um, for for industry, um, but normally a lot of it is skilled. You have to have the skills to be able to do that. Um, so there is still a lot of people here that are unemployed. Mm -hmm. So do you see a lot of people, um, you know, you, you said your, uh, your son is going to college um, uh, with other like, you know, young people too. Do you see them staying in Vermont or do you see them leaving Vermont? What, what, do, you, what do you see as like sort of the, the future for, you know, and not even just, um, you know, black youth in Vermont, but what do you see as the future for, for all, all youth in, in Vermont? Yeah, actually, it's like a big push right now because they are we are seeing the youth leave, right? We yeah. are seeing, in fact, the colleges are closing down. You can look and see that a lot of the colleges in Vermont have been either consolidated or absolutely sh shut down. There was one here called Southern Vermont College that was shut down two, three years ago. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, the youth are leaving. Uh, here, uh, part of it is that we're not keeping up with the um, with the modern standards. And also, like, yeah, I see kids leave high school and they don't want to come back. They know they know what's right and wrong. We have new generations of people who are who show up different. They show up as queer. They show up as they're black and brown. A lot of a lot of mixed children here. Right. Um, and a lot of. Um, people with disabilities, if they can leave, they leave because this is not a place that really welcomes and, and helps them out. So, and youth understand that and they want broad, broad options. I will say this, that I have seen youth leave, they graduate and they go somewhere else and they come back and they're like, whoo, I was not prepared. I was not prepared to be around so many different people from right. different places yeah. that speak different languages and eat different food. And, and, you know, like all, they weren't prepared. It was a total sh culture shock for them because they were not given any kind of exposure and they will come back and reiterate that to their family and to the community. Like we need to do better. Cause the world is big and it's diverse and there are people from all over that you guys didn't teach us about. And so, yeah, I think, um, I think there is a push now that, and a recognition they have done studies on that, that there are youth who are leaving and, and, and we're not drawing in crowds of people. Uh, I think one thing did help was, um, COVID, we were really good with COVID here um, in terms of the rates and, and everything. And, uh, you know, so people, there were some people moving back in for that. And, um, and so, but it wasn't enough. They have incentive programs, even if you have a work from home job, like they're really trying work from home job. They'll give you a $10,000 stipend to move here and things like that. So the state is really aware of the fact that a lot of our citizens are aging out, if you will, and that the, that the population is dwindling because it's not welcome, welcoming or inviting to others. Right. Do you think, um, um, what do you really think the issue is then? Because if uh, the government is showering uh, potential um, new movers to Vermont with $10,000 stipends and things like that, do you think um, um, the issue is with um, what would like Vermont being boring? Is that an issue for people that that, that people don't want to move there because it seems like the government's doing a lot. Like if the government is offering people $10,000 to, or something to move to Vermont, that 
that sounds pretty good to me. But what what do you think the issue is that that, that people don't want to don't want to flood Vermont? Well, we we don't have our technology down. Like I cannot go for a ride in Vermont and keep any kind of signal on my cell phone. Mm-hmm. Our internet, so we don't have high speed internet through here. We don't have the right uh, infrastructure for that. I mean, so that 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 plays a factor. Um, I wouldn't say it's totally boring. We have skiing, we have hiking, we have all kinds of outdoor, um, you know, opportunities. It's beautiful. Like that's one of the things that keeps like, like I have never seen a place so beautiful. The different seasons. I, when I go on a drive, I'm just like, I can't believe it. it's like a picture I live in. And I think um, black and brown people want to enjoy the beauty of the environment as well. It's just all the other factors. Again, it comes down to being welcomed. And and if you're bringing a diverse community in and welcoming that as they come and not tokenizing them and forcing them to assimilate and forcing them to act the way you want them to act or whatever, then you have... Um, a breeding ground for having more entertainment, having more sources of people, you know, concerts, if you will, or whatever makes people stay, right? Whatever, like you bring them in and they will bring the entertainment with them, right? But you got to make it sustainable for them. You got to have good schools. You got to have good hospitals. You got to have good police. You got to just have a good uh, environment all together. So yeah, there might not be a whole lot to do here, but if you go up to Burlington, there's a lot of stuff, more, more stuff down here to do. Um, and, but you have to make it a place that people want to come and educate their kids and have a career and, you know, just live in peace. Cause at the end of the day, that's all we really want to do is just live our lives in peace. Right. Right. You know, I think, um, I mean, that's, that's, yeah, it's a hundred percent true. Um, and I, yeah, I'm sure there's, there's a whole lot to do in Vermont and, um, it's just definitely sounds very attractive to, to nature types. Um, I do, I do have some questions about, um, t- about sort of incarceration. Um, yeah. I've totally forgotten. We, we've been talking. I know about- we've been on a roller coaster. <laughs> we've been, we've been on- talking about the beauty of Vermont. It's some, so some, some great things. It's an ecosystem, though. It, yeah. it, it all goes together. It's all connected. For sure. Um, I'm sort of wondering, um, so, some questions I had about incarceration, and, and you know, you can speak to, to what you know. Um, do you see as if, um, uh, you know, maybe particularly Black males that are in the, the, the Vermont criminal justice system, do you see them being sort of... Uh, prepared when they get out of the Vermont criminal justice system? Um, and do you see sort of like um, a lot of reoffense rates, maybe, you know, um, black and brown people, you know, maybe um, continually going in and out of Vermont prisons and, and not really being economically set up for the future? What, what, what do you see? So the recidivism, well, so there's a difference between the prisons and the jails, right? So the prisons, we don't really, I don't really see people come out of there. I don't even really, actually somebody was just released after 20 years. Um, but we do a lot of, this state does a lot of contracting with other states and their prisons because they're overflowed, they're not fit. So a lot of people don't even end up serving uh, their time here in the state of Vermont. Uh, they, uh, they end up going to places like Kentucky, uh, down South, um, places like that. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, and in terms of the jail, though, I do see a lot of like people coming in and out of jail, right? Like they'll be sentenced to one or two or three years, and that's really kind of a jail. It's not prison time; it's just jail time. And I right. do see people come uh, in and out a lot, and um, uh, you know, we could talk really about the psychological stuff. There's not a lot of rehabilitation happening anyway, and there's no supports on the other end. So a lot of them will um, still need to do probation or, or some sort of connection to, uh, to fulfill their, their sentence or whatever, to be part of the parole system. And um, 
I have reports of people who say that when they're getting ready to end their trial with the parole system or the probation system, that police get a list of those people and they start following them and trying to find ways to put them uh, back in the system. These are reports that I get. I don't have a whole lot of data on that per se. Um, They're not keeping data on that, but, um, and they're not telling those secrets, you know, that's not, that's, it's kind of a, a, a hearsay thing. Um, but what I, but I will say, I, I have heard m- multiple stories of that, like people who are almost done uh, with their, with the, with their um, commitment, if you will, yeah. pay their debt and be pulled over for something and get caught up on the smallest of things yeah. to keep them still in the system. And, and so um and so I don't know if that answers your question, uh, but I do see a, a concerted effort to keep people in the system. Yeah, yeah. No, instead no, of rehabilitating them, instead of giving them resources to be better, um, instead of helping them find employment and all of that. And not to mention the, the, um, the fact that they have to pay a lot of time, like they have to pay to their probation officers. They have to pay fees for classes, for whatever, whatever. And they have to show employment. And if you're not employed, then you have, you know, you go back in and the, just the the setup, there's a setup to get you back in, right? And you, lots of hoops, lots of barriers to to overcome. And I think that that's pretty normal for the United States as well, so. No, a hundred percent. I think, um... I think I'm, I'm beginning to be able to like paint a picture of sort of like maybe what the, the situation might be like if you're um, like a, a black male in Vermont. Um, it, it maybe seems as if um, like, say, you know, I'm just going to Vermont or something and just hanging out. Um, maybe, you know, the, the police are consistently looking for maybe an excuse to pull you over or something. Um, and, you know, if you're not doing anything illegal at all, um, but if you're being pulled over, you know, uh, multiple times over the course of a year, you may end up with a speeding ticket. You may end up with multiple tickets, parking tickets, things like that. And these things maybe build up until maybe, you know, economically could be crushed by the, the, the weight of tickets or or maybe at some point um, because, you know, uh, the police sort of have this more control over you, more surveillance over you. They find you doing um, something small and that, that mm-hmm. is I swear, if you followed me around for a long period of time, you're going to find something. I know a man who came here and got 12 tickets within 20 days. Whoa. 12 tickets. And some of them, like all of them, very minor things, including a parking ticket. Like they, it was like they were following him every time he walked out the door. Wow. Every time he walked out the door, he got a parking ticket um, because he parked his car in front of the laundromat yeah, in a no parking zone to unload his laundry for his family and you know, kids and stuff like that. Yeah. It's much easier to just unload here and then repark. And while you unload, he was unloading, they gave him a ticket. Like, unless you were, if you were like up on me doing in my everyday life, you're going to find ways to ticket me. Yeah, There will be things that I do. I think that's true of everybody, including cops yeah. who know the law, right? So yeah, you're right. You're painting the right picture. You are absolutely painting the right picture. Um, and and that 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 gentleman who got 12 tickets in 20 days, we did a complaint against the police. First of all, the police at the time didn't have a mechanism for complaints. There was no internal investigation, internal affairs. There were nothing in place for for people to for, lodge a complaint against the police. They were then forced because of a new law, state law that was um, enacted to put in a mechanism for that. And they put up this website that said complaint, compliments and complaints because they couldn't couldn't leave out compliments, right? Um, so, so we decided to use it and test it on this young man. We did, and they didn't have a mechanism for reviewing cases. So it went to the select board. The select board is like a city board 
it's like the city council. We, since it's a town, there's no city council. We have elected officials who run the town, basically, who make decisions about the town. So they they took in this complaint, but they didn't get any more information other than the complaint itself from the person who was complaining, complaining the complainant. Um, they had the cops respond to that complaint. So they took those two things, the cops response and the complaint and made a determination that they didn't, they didn't, they weren't harassed. I mean, by very nature, 12 tickets in 20 days is harassment as far as I'm concerned, but they found that there was no, no harassment and they decided to put the, um, the complainants, this young man's phone number, his address, uh, his mother's phone number and address, all this really personal information up, like basically doxed him on the internet, right? Which led to harassment from townspeople. Like, how dare you talk about our police like that? We have the, you're a criminal, you're the thug, you know, all kinds of racist stuff was happening to them. And forced them out of town in the middle of the night. They just left out of town. But it it did more than that. It sends a message to anybody who wants to complain about what's going on yeah. that you will be, there will be retaliation from it, not just from the police, yeah. but from the entire town and the people who run the town. Yeah. So we have another lawsuit going on for that. Um, but it just goes to show how how it can be so suffocating to be in a in a position like that and to be a black and a black or brown person here you know i have cases of where um um a young 14 year old latino boy is playing in the creek with his friends his white friends and the police come down to the creek come down the creek i mean it's a trek to get down into the creek could see him playing with his friends 14 and starts arresting him and his white friends are like what are you doing what are you doing why are you doing this and he's like well there was a robbery down the street and he matches the description it's a 14 year old who was playing in the creek and he's like there they had to swear the white kids swear up and down that they he was with them the whole time that he hasn't been anywhere he didn't commit any robbery this is and that and they let him go but do you see like the problem with that? First of all, you know, they're just making assumptions based on this, this, this description, fitting this description. And, and now these white kids are forever like, look at how much power we have. <laughs> we can get a man arrested or unarrested or whatever, a person. Yeah. And so there was all kinds of messages that were sent that day, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's, that starts at a young age. Well, wow. that's, that's honestly um, insane to hear. You know, I think um, a lot of maybe cities in America, um, we've gotten to the point of, you know, uh, um, political correctness on the, on the side of white people to where um, outright uh, verbal harassment isn't really a day-to-day -day thing for, for people. Um, and to hear that that is the case in Vermont is actually quite surprising for me. It uh, definitely feels very intense. Um, do you think, um, you know, the, the current like um, racial ethnic situation in Vermont, do you think that should be like um, a nationwide story? Do you think people need to know about this? I do think so. I think that people are confused like me. I came here with the land of Bernie. And uh, Ben and Jerry's and just like loving hippies. I think that it needs to be known, uh, you know, more wide, widely. I mean, you look in New Hampshire, too. There's a big problems over there, too. New England in general. Um, one of the things I want to leave you with, too, is that, you know, Vermont likes to, is very proud of the fact that they claim that they were the first to abolish slavery. And two things from that. Number one, they, they didn't completely abolish slavery. There were two clauses that still exist in our Vermont constitution to this day. And we have people trying to get them removed. 
that enslavement of children is okay. And so that was still there. Like that was a clause. And then basically another clause is that, you know, basically if you have committed a crime, then enslavement is okay. Right. Like, and we saw that in the 13th amendment, right. Uh, the constitution, when we as a nation decided to abolish slavery through the civil war and all of the different ways that, you know, the 13th amendment came up, they put that clause in there. This is as long as, yeah, you haven't committed a crime. You you are free. They took that from Vermont. That that was taken from Vermont's constitution. That kind of um, that kind of clause, that exception to it, right? Which now we see enslavement in a different way, which is mass incarceration, and we see that translating into our current numbers, right? So just thinking about that. They'll still talk about how Vermont cannot possibly be racist because they were the first to abolish slavery. So just, just putting that into per perspective. Yeah. Did that juxtaposition that that is something that they're very proud of and therefore it negates their racism. And if anything, they just found a way around it nicely. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the United States Constitution, when they made the 13th Amendment, used the same language, except for the child piece. But the, ch the children being enslaved, and we see that now um, in iterations with transracial adoption. There's a lot of transracial adoption still ha occurring here today in Vermont, in spe especially. I wouldn't necessarily say that today that white people who adopt black and brown kids are looking to enslave them, but it's still a mentality, right? That was a way of, to circumvent uh, the abolishment of slavery was to add that clause. I will also say that I just, um, that I just um, recognized an enslaved woman in Bennington. We, we were able to, the museum was able to find evidence of uh, an enslaved woman in this area. And we decided to dedicate a, a stone in her name uh, so that people would be recognize her. And she was enslaved until 1778. And Vermont so-called abolished slavery in 1777. And if you look into the whole abolishing of slavery, they they were like we did it, but we're not going to enforce it too too much. So it took a while for them to completely abolish slavery, and I might say they still haven't. Wow, I think uh, sort of the last thing I'll leave you on. Maybe we can um, end on maybe a positive note. Um, yeah. Do you see things in Vermont uh, like going in the right direction? We're trying. We just dedicated a stopping stone for an enslaved woman in Vermont right? Like that yeah. is something to be celebrate, right? We're saying her name now and people will have to say her name with Margaret Peg Bowen, who lived in Vermont one time and made a contribution. And we have people who are very well intentioned, but we need more than an intentions. We need actual action. And so we will keep pressing towards that. And we do have a lot of allies here who are, who are trying to move past that, that history and trying to understand how it shows up here in Vermont and our defensive. So I will say that there is a, an effort at the same time that harm is also happening. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think uh, you're doing personally a, a great job with, um, you know, really starting the conversation for a lot of people, it seems like from your work and and, and really being able to, to speak up on, on a lot of these issues that are going on in your state. So Thank you, thank, you, thank you so much for talking to me. Of course.